again. I'm glad to be back with you. And today it's with a dynamics problem. Now, this is a problem that came out of a very old dynamics book, but it's pretty neat, so I thought I'd share it with you. Let's say we've got a well here, which is basically just you know, a deep hole with water at the bottom. We want to know how deep the well is. Well, how are you going to do that? The easiest way, or a very easy way anyway, is to just drop a rock or a ball or something. A rock would be good down the well and listen for the splash. The wall, ball's going to go down and make a, and, uh, there, making sure I was traveling, makes a splash and then when it makes the splash, the sound waves travel back up where somebody can hear it. Maybe the person who dropped the, the rock can hear it. So we know two things are going to happen. The, ball, the rock is going to accelerate under the force of gravity, so it's constant acceleration on the way down, and we're assuming air resistance is negligible. Um, and then the, the sound wave is going to travel back up. So we're going to need to know the speed of sound. Well, let's assume that g is 9.81 meters per second squared, squared, and the speed of sound is 340 meters per second. And that's pretty close to the right answer. Those are pretty good numbers. Let's also assume the depth of the well is D. Now, we don't know what that is yet. All right? Last bit of information we're given is that the total time for the ball to, or the rock, to go all the way to the bottom of the well, make a splash. There, that's a splash noise. I spent way too much time in junior high school learning to make that noise. And when it makes that noise, it comes back up. And you can hear it. So, well, time one, that's, that's the drop, and time two is the sound. Okay? Time one is the time it takes the ball to drop from the top of the well to the, to the water surface. Time two is the time it takes the sound to come back up the well. Well, how are we going to do that? Let's start with T1. All right. Well, we're dropping under constant acceleration, right? So we know the expression for that, x of t equals one half, I'm going to make that y, just because we normally assume up and down with y. That's probably better. g t squared plus v zero t plus y zero. Well, we can assume that we're going to just drop the rock. We're not going to throw it, so that's going to go to zero. And we can put our, the origin of our coordinate system right there. So that goes to zero. Now, at the exact instant when the rock hits the water, we know it's time T's to T1, and we also know that that's distance D. Well, let's put those numbers in there. D equals one half G T1 squared. All right, there's one expression. Now, I don't know what D is, and I don't know what T1 is, so I've got one equation and two unknowns. That's not going to cut it. And if I have two unknowns, I need two equations. So let's do this. T2. I'm going to write out as an expression that relates time and distance to the speed of sound. Well, the distance traveled is the speed times the time, right? So the distance traveled on the way back up equals the speed of sound times time two. So let's go over here and uh, solve for T1 equals 2D over G, and the square root of that, all right? So that's, that's T1 equals that. T2 is a little easier. That's D over Vs. All right, I've now got expressions for time 1 and time 2. I don't know what time 1 is. I don't know what time 2 is. I don't know D. Ugh. I've got three equations, three unknowns. Well, three, three, I should be able to solve that. I know that this equals 4 seconds. All right, that's given in the problem. And so let's just start plugging these into there. So I can write 2d over g, square root of that, plus d over vs equals 4. Well, look at that. That's one equation, and the only thing I don't know in it is d. I know everything else. So that's one equation and one unknown. Once I solve that, I know what d is. Right? Okay, so how are we going to solve this? Well, there's a lot of ways to do it, and I'll tell you two of them right now. Um, let's see, let's get rid of this stuff here since we don't need it anymore. Okay, and I don't need that anymore either. 
I can just simply plot this, the left side of this equation. Actually, let me get rid of my box here now. Okay, I'm going to call this a function of d. When that function equals 4, I'll know what d is. So if I plot this, and you can plot it in MathCAD or MATLAB or Excel or whatever, it looks kind of like that. All right. There you go. And go out here, and if you do that, run the numbers so that this is d, and this is f of d. When this equals 4, d equals 70, I'm going to make sure I get the number right here, 70.55 meters. All right. That solves the problem. We now know, just by graphic, graphing it, d is 70.55 meters. Okay. Now that's hitting the problem with a fairly large hammer. We're just drawing a picture of this function. There's some cleaner ways to do it. If you want to plug this number into your calculus, function into your calculator, you can make one change. Oops, minus, ah, zero. Okay, make that change. Use the root function on your calculator and find the root. That's, that's basically doing this. That's not conceptually any different. Or you can do one other thing. And that's to, to solve this analytically. Let's go back to my initial expression. Start there. And now I want this, this expression here to be on the other side as well. So I'll subtract it from both sides. And so I get that. If I square both sides, I'll have a d on that side and d squared and a d on that side. And I can use the quadratic equation and find the roots that way. No matter how you do it, you're going to get the same answer, though. These are all mathematically equivalent to one another. And d is 70.55 meters. I hope this helps you out, and I'll see you next time.